make sure those that are with us digitally that you're giving him a digital clap, all right? So if you don't know how to do that, why push some of the buttons on your uh, screen or whatever it is you're working with. I wanted to kind of bring us up to date on a few things. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me if I'm all right because I was gone a couple of Sundays and then I was gone a Sunday. And so, uh, of course, everybody thinks, you know, that you have COVID. I do not have, I have not had, and as far as I know, I do not presently have. And I've been tested and all that kind of stuff. So I, I have no COVID, but I did have a little bit of a thing I had to work out in regards to my tummy tuck. So I had surgery, and I don't have a tummy anymore. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, had, I had some uh, issues that, that I need to get worked out, and then it all worked out fine. And then I had a week's vacation that was already planned, which I do every year in November. Uh, and I uh, planned on having uh, Courtney Turner, who you saw last Sunday. And then I also had uh, Lewis Monroe, who I've wanted to get for years. And I finally actually had him. And uh, the reason that I had Courtney and Lewis on the same Sunday, uh, Lewis told me in his senior years as a pastor still working and ministering um, he said pastor I don't do early services and I said okay Lewis all right I said well which service would you be willing to do he said well I can do the 930 I said okay great I'll get somebody for the 815 so what a pleasure to have both those gentlemen here uh, Courtney uh, did a great job pastor Monroe is a long standing man of God, faithful to the ministry, to his family, to his wife, to his community, and uh, I'm just, you know, he's, he's an inspiration to me. I love Courtney. I have to tell you, um, the church I usually go to when I'm on vacation up by King City, I go to uh, uh, Berlin Church, Mount Mariah there, and uh, Doug Delaney, the pastor, been going there, I don't know how. I don't know, 10 or 12 years, something like that, a long time. Take my boys there. Uh, we've actually attended the Thanksgiving service of that church because uh, we've gotten to know people real well. But anyway, I called, uh, I touched base with uh, Pastor Delaney, and he told me, he said, hey, I'm sorry to tell you, but we're not going to have physical services this Sunday. And five of his folks actually had COVID and were sick. And so uh, I wasn't able to go to the church that I normally go to. But, uh, so, I watched Green Valley, uh, both the service and uh, the second sermon, first service and the second sermon. I have to tell you, I like to fell out of my tree. I was in a tree stand, and uh, I was watching the service, and I was listening with um, Bluetooth earbuds, you know what I mean, you know? as well as listening for leaves ruff, ruffling and stuff. But anyway, uh, when Courtney said, and I just got, such, I, I got such a kick out of this, I'm going to do something with this, and I told him he needs to do something too. I'll give him credit. But uh, he said, you know, we need Jesus. And then he said, uh, you know, you need to put on Jesus. He said, you know, you go out in the morning, and uh, you get ready, and you put on clothes. You don't go out naked. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That's not a good idea. So uh, he said, but you need to put on Jesus in the morning. Otherwise, you are spiritually naked. And I had an image suddenly of all these spiritually naked people walking around and how absolutely uh, shocking that would be. And, and yet that's actually really important truth. So that's, that is a big deal. I really, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's time, uh, Brother Monroe said, and uh, Courtney told us we need Jesus. And I, I, really, I really love that. Let me tell you just a little bit of how uh, our church has actually developed and, you know, how we've done things lately because, you know, it gets confusing. So one, I'm not sick, and uh, I, it just all worked out different. But... Our staff got COVID, as in four of our staff got COVID in their families. So um, that really made it difficult to function as a church when my staff are sick 
and could be uh, more sick, as in, you know, it started with a handful, it could have gone on to others. It didn't, uh, neither I or, or, or Cord or, or Jason or Winona actually had it, but the rest of our staff and our families did. Everybody's done fine. Uh, probably Faith was the one we're most concerned about, and she should be back tomorrow, uh, and we should open up the office and be gone. But when that happened, I, I decided, no, that's too much. And I don't know what, as in the timetable, to know that everything was okay, that everybody's all right. Uh, it was too quick. And so I said, okay, we're just going to go to live stream. Um, and so that's what we've done, I think, what, two, three Sundays now? Yeah, three Sundays. This is the third Sunday, yeah. And so um, next Sunday... We will go back to in-person worship. But I need you to listen real careful to me, okay? We will be militant about wearing a mask. I need you to know that, okay? So much so that if you come in here and try not to wear a mask, we'll ask you to leave. I need you to know that, okay? People in our church have died. People in our church have come close to dying. And people in our church are fighting, uh, living right now. So this is not a game. And this is not your opinion or somebody else's opinion. These are real lives, real families, real death, real sickness, and real problems. So we're going to take it real serious. This week, of course, Thanksgiving week, and uh, we're going to, uh, nothing's going to be happening really. You know, the office will be open uh, normally. And uh, we will, but we'll have no activities this week until the next week. So next Sunday, we'll have in person, and then we will begin to put our activities back and uh, move forward and uh, see things uh, improve. And now, you know, I want you to know that uh, everything has gone fine, everything that I know of. Um, and uh, we've been praying for Todd Miller and I don't know if Todd's still in here or not, but he, he rang in with us this morning. So if you're there, Todd, hello, brother. Glad, uh, glad you're okay and pray that you get healed quickly. But uh, we are, we're just going to be moving forward and making a difference. Amen? Now, I want to say something special. The ladies do a lot of great, wonderful things together. And uh, you ladies are better about getting together and you talk and tell everything. And, uh, but we guys are not like that. But uh, we do need things. So I just wanna say, um, Jason has started a men's gathering, ministry, encouragement, uh, spiritual strength on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And that will come back the Wednesday following our Thanksgiving week, right? But I also want to say that I'm going to be reaching out to all the men of our church and asking them if they would be willing to reach out and let us know if they would like some help in their spiritual lives. I've had numerous men come to me and their family situation the habits in their lives, uh, the way that they're handling and their priorities and so on are all messed up. And uh, as a guy, that is hard to admit that we need help. We feel like we ought to be able to do it on our own, be a big boy, man it up, so on and so forth. But that doesn't actually work like that. It doesn't work like that for me, and it won't work like that for any other man. The fact is, is that we need each other. And so I'm going to be reaching out and saying, hey, fellas, um, would you be willing to come to Wednesday night? Be, would you be willing to join in on something that will improve the habits of your life and do it with some other fellas? And um, just don't be alone anymore. Don't be alone anymore. Uh, I want, I want you to know, so I'm, if you are watching right now or you're here right now and you'd like to do that, please personal message me, okay? 
you can go on Facebook, even if you don't have Facebook, and you can personally message me. Uh, I think it's free, but it might cost you a dollar. If it costs you a dollar, well, so be it. Pay a buck. But you can get a hold of me on personal message. No one else will know about it. And uh, I promise you that we will only do what you want to do. So I would encourage you uh, to please reach out and to uh, take part in that. Because I'd like to see more and more of us guys getting stronger and better because um, we need it. We need it. I, I learned a long time ago with Promise Keepers not to be alone. Not to be alone. Okay. So, today I want to come from Romans chapter 8. Oh, I, meant, I got one other thing. This, you know, ADHD, so hang on. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not on medication either, so you're just getting it raw. So, here is, can you pick that up? Move around. Go over there and show those boxes if you would, please. So, uh, we have, and Zach, did you hear from Jerry? No, okay. Well, anyway, I know that we have over 1,300 boxes that are packed up and that we will be uh, sending out. These have come from our church members, and I think there are over 100 there. And so, uh, those are going to be picked up today and tomorrow. So, if you have a box, you need to bring it. And uh, they'll be receiving those in the, in the foyer. You don't have to get out of your car. You don't have to come in. They'll come get them for you. And uh, then that'll be happening today, I think, from 1 to 3, and tomorrow, 1 to 3, I think. 9 to 11. Okay, there you go. See? So if you come here and put it in front of the door, we'll make sure it gets there. All right? But anyway, those, those are happening, and I think that's an absolutely wonderful thing. All right, now back to Romans chapter 8. All right, are you with me? Are the people out there with me? Ethan, are they with me? Are they giving a thumbs up? Are they putting out a heart? Anybody putting on an angry emoji or what? Not yet. Okay, great. All right, Romans chapter 8. Today I want to talk about not being separated. I want to talk about actually being glued. I want to talk about being secure. I want to talk about having assurance, not insurance. Hello? Insurance, you know, costs you money. And all it does is replace what you got. But it doesn't give you assurance. It doesn't give you assurance. And I want to do that in Romans chapter 8. Now, I would, I would tell you, and I've told many, and I would encourage others as well, Romans 7 and 8 are important chapters for you to understand. You know why? We find ourselves saying one thing and doing another. We find ourselves wanting to do something and never doing it. We find ourselves being actually uh, inconsistent with ourselves. And it's embarrassing. And it's frustrating. And sometimes it makes us undercover agents. <laughs> you know, makes us feel horrible. And uh, we think it's just because we are bad and unredeemable. And that's not true. But today, I want to talk about the reality of salvation and the reality of how that once God is in our lives, we can never lose Him. We can never lose Him. And I want you to understand that. So Romans chapter 8 is coming and, and answering some issues that 7 brings up about sin and forgiveness and condemnation for sin and the judgment of sin and, you know, the law, and grace, and so on. And, and one of the ways I, I think I would say it best, I stole a cone in Boulder, Colorado, when I was young, and a detective saw me do it. They were right behind me. And so they arrested me and took me to the Boulder uh, Police Department, and they booked me in the whole nine yards, uh, and then they let me go. And when I got home... I was more afraid of what my dad was going to do than what the Boulder Police Department was going to do. And when I got home, uh, my dad, instead of a normal, long speech that made me want to die, uh, he gave me, literally, uh, just a smile and said, did you learn anything? And I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, good, let's move on, let's eat. So I, I was really, really thankful for it. I'll never forget that. 
I'll never forget that. Uh, another time in my life, I was doing a big report in college, and I had a very important piece of that report that was missing. And so I was standing in front of my class. This is your whole grade was on one literal project. And here I stood. I didn't have everything. I thought, okay, well, I'll have to take that class over again because I just flunked it. And when I got my paper, I got an A minus. And I was like, wow, what in the world? And uh, the professor said, David, in life, you're going to prepare and you're going to work hard, but something's going to be missing. And what you do after that is going to make all the difference in the world. So what I'm trying to say is this. Grace. Grace. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We're sinners. We make mistakes. And the fact is, is that grace is what sets us free from our sin and guilt. And that's really what Romans is really talking about, how salvation is actually established. But the trouble with that is this. Once you come to Christ, now you want to be good. You feel like you should be good. You all of a sudden, you know, I mean, when I was, when I was without Christ, I didn't give a rip. You know, rip, flip, whatever you want to say. I didn't care. Whatever pleased me, that's what I did. And if it didn't please me, I didn't do it anymore. And so that's the way I lived. And then when I came to Christ, all of a sudden I had a conscience. And now I actually cared about things. And yet I found myself not able to do everything that I believed and wanted and that God wanted to do in my life. And so grace becomes this very important thing. And so Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Okay? Everybody with me? All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, this is, this is talking about something really important for us. Um, I think there's a lot of Christians that sort of present this idea that when you come to Jesus, you don't have any more troubles. Uh, that you'll be able to change your life in every pleasurable way by just praying it in Jesus' name. Um, I don't hate that, but I severely dislike it because it's not true. So when my daughter was born, with that ideology, I'm not a very good Christian because I can't have a baby. That's okay. When the church people, when I was pastoring, and they, you know, give you a gut punch, I was like, I must not be a very good Christian. When trouble comes, we have a tendency to think that it's because of our own deserved or undeserved behavior. And that's not true. That's not true. Just remember this. Jesus was vilified, persecuted, mocked, made up things. They called him a drunkard and a glutton. I mean, come on, this is a guy that can fast for 40 days. How do you call that guy a glutton? You know? But the reality is, is that people will do that. People do that. They did it to Jesus. They've done it to God. They've done it to his prophets. They've done it to his, his patriarchs, matriarchs. He'll, they, they do it all the time. But remember this, okay? We have suffering even though we are believers. But here's the deal. What God has promised to us is worth more than anything we go through. So one of the things I had to learn when I started running uh, as a teenager, and I ran for my high school in uh, cross country, I had to learn to run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles up and down the mountains in the hot and the dry and the wet and the cold and the whatever. And uh, I remember one time, I literally thought I was going to die. I was running up with my team up this mountain, and I thought I literally was going to, I mean, seriously, I thought I'm just going to fall dead here. And then the next thing I know, I got what's called a second wind. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but it is, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's not something that you can necessarily program. But here's the point. God has promised us a second wind. We run this race until the end. And God has promised us a second win. This life is not the promise. 
this life is where we work out the promise of, with God's grace and God's power and God's spirit. And so it's important to understand you've got to compare everything that's going on with what Jesus Christ has offered and provided and promised to you and I. And one of the things that got me through every race is that there's a finish line. And when I got there, guess what? I could collapse and lay down and eat and drink and celebrate, you know, maybe. <laughs> you know? The good news for us is that we're all going to cross the same finish line. We're all going to get the same prize. Isn't that, isn't that a good thing? You know, if we're all going to receive salvation. So remember this. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Verse 19, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility. This is important to understand. In the fall where Adam and Eve sinned, not only did they fall, but all creation fell. This world is not perfect. Weeds started growing up. The earth is declining. The sun is declining. The universe is declining. This world is falling apart. The second law of thermodynamics says everything is breaking down. Everything is breaking down. And the reason I bring that up is because we need to remember Yes, we have a virus that is very destructive. But we've always had viruses and bacteria. We've always had disease and difficulty and poverty and starvation and violence. And we've had all these things. Um, when I was in the woods, it was very important for no other things to come around while I'm there. Not to disturb, you know, what I'm doing. I had a cat come out of nowhere and came right under where I was sitting and pooped right in front of me and then did its, you know, thing like that. And I was like, is he trying to say something? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Poop on you, you know. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. All the woods of the world and this cat has to come and do its thing under my my uh, uh, pursuit of something to put in the refrigerator. So the reality is that that's kind of the way life is, isn't it? You know, I mean, we just have trouble. The Bible tells us very clearly in verse 20, creation was subject to futility, meaning it fell. We don't live in a perfect world. Storms, creation, plants, systems, all of it. All of it is fallen. Not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free. So, you know, when the Lord comes and the second coming takes place and then the rapture takes place and the order of all that, I don't know, but I do know this, it's all going to happen. The bottom line is, is that we're not only going to be redeemed, so is this world. And do you know what Revelation actually says? That God will put another heaven and an earth a new heaven and a new earth. He will speak it into existence again, and he will speak it into existence in perfection. It will be redeemed. So I want you to understand, we don't live in a perfect world, and creation itself has actually fallen, and it's actually going to be redeemed just like we are. Now this is our hope. This is our hope and our future glory. This is what we actually are hoping for. That creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Any of you ladies had babies? I'm not asking you guys, because I know you had any. Maybe a kidney stone or something. <laughs> and the ladies all say, nah, that ain't nothing. <laughs> Take a watermelon and have it. So, you know, the bottom line is, is that that's a very painful experience. Okay? Creation itself is going through that kind of pain. And so are we. 
and we will until the Lord comes and sets everything right. And so in this verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, amen? We ourselves are actually having difficulty. We are actually having hard times. Not now. We were having them before. We'll have them after. It is a part of the journey of faith. Turn it up real loud. Hi, Phil Swift here for Flex Tape, the super strong waterproof tape that can instantly patch, bond, seal, and repair. Flex Tape is no ordinary tape. Its triple thick adhesive virtually welds itself to the surface, instantly stopping the toughest leaks. Leaky pipes can cause major damage, but Flex Tape grips on tight and bonds instantly. Plus, Flex Tape's powerful adhesive is so strong, it even works underwater. Now you can repair leaks in pools and spas without draining them. Flex Tape is perfect for marine, campers, and RVs. Flex Tape is super strong, and once it's on, it holds on tight. And for emergency auto repair, Flex Tape keeps its grip, even in the toughest conditions. Big storms can cause big damage, but Flex Tape comes super wide, so you can easily patch large holes. To show you the power of Flex Tape, I saw this boat in half and repaired it with only Flex Tape. Not only does Flex Tape's powerful adhesive hold the boat together, but it creates a super strong watertight seal. So the inside is completely dry. <laughs> I just want you to know I'm not receiving any compensation from Flex Tape, all right? That is just an illustration. But here's the thing we need to remember, all right? We literally are corrupted today. Our bodies, our world, our whole lives are messed up. But this is the work of God that salvation and the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and takes our broken lives and makes them work, makes them become functional, become new. But nothing is completely new until the Lord comes again. In Romans, again, it says that we actually walk in the Spirit and this is important, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit, meaning we become the first fruits of the actual repair of things, meaning we are the redemption of God. We're the light of the world. We're the hope of the world. We are the literal, actual work and presence and body of God. And so this groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, I want to get this. When Jesus Christ came to my life, my life is not completely fixed. I now have the power and the presence and the righteousness of God in my life that I could never have on my own, but I am still a sinner living by grace. I'm redeemed. I'm secure. I am put back together by Jesus Christ's flex tape. And I'm able to actually glide across the water and not leak, <laughs> as it were, by the power of God. We're adopted, okay? We're adopted. But our adoption is not complete. So, for instance, when I adopted two children, they came to live with me immediately. But they were not my children for several months. It wasn't until... We went to Clay County and sat in a room and had all the evidence and all the presentations and all the testimonies. And then the judge decided yes or no, announced his decision, and hit the gavel. And from that moment forward, the adoption is what? Complete. And my children became my children, and their parents became their parents, and we were all one family but it took a long time. It took a long time. 
And what I want you to understand is that for you and I, even though Jesus Christ has redeemed us, even though the Lord has forgiven us, even though the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are not complete until he comes again or we go to be with him. That is when we feel completion. So we eagerly await for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Verse 24 says, for this is the hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, meaning you don't hope for things you already have. You enjoy the things you have. You hope for things that are not here yet. So we need to remember this. We're not in perfection yet. We're not in a redeemed and completed and fixed world yet. My life is not perfect. How about yours? Hello? Can I get a thumbs up? <laughs> the fact is, is that you and I are not perfect. But we hope for perfection. We're waiting for the glory. We're waiting for the Lord. Okay? For in this hope we were saved. Now hope is that is, not, is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with what? Patience. Oh my. That's hard. It's hard to be patient. Hard to be patient. We have to have faith to be patient. We have to trust. We have to rely. We have to believe. Now remember this. We have a liar who speaks into our hearts all the time. Speaks to our minds all the time. How many of you would hire a liar to stand in your house and talk to you and your kids all day long. I don't think anybody ever do that. I don't actually see people go and buy, you know, framed lies and put them up in their houses. I don't see people get tattoos that are lies. I see people get truth and put it on their wall. I see people that get tattoos of hope and of of something that's very special and so on, they put those there. But the fact is, is that people do not embrace lies openly. But I'm telling you right now, the old devil's a liar. He's a thief and he's a murderer, and he does everything he can to destroy us. And this is the, this is the thing that we need to remind ourselves. It ain't here yet. It ain't here yet. We have faith. We have Christ. We have salvation. But it's not complete. We are waiting for the completion with patience. Verse 26 says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In our weakness. Can I say, you and I need to be very, very certain to not pretend like we got it all together. We need to be transparent and honest. We need to be open and truthful about our lives. Um... As a pastor, I've always, I've always spoken openly. To the chagrin, do you know what that word means? Okay, I learned it from my wife's grandmother. She told me she was chagrined at me, and I said, I don't know what that means. Is that good or bad? What? <laughs> you know, uh, I was going too fast in my Mustang, 69 Mustang. But anyway, so uh, I realized that chagrin's not good. The, you know, the reality for you and me is that we have to boast in our weakness. Who does that? Well, true believers do it. Truly redeemed, those who have grace, they tell the truth about themselves and about their life and about God and what's really, really true. And so you and I need to understand, we hope for, wait for, with patience, but the Spirit helps us when we recognize our weakness. And so I know that I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be redeemed. I don't deserve to be married. I don't deserve to be a father. I don't deserve to be a pastor. I don't deserve the things that are in my life. But by God's grace and by the forgiveness and the kindness of other people, by others, in my weakness, God has given me something that I could not obtain. Verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for... Let's all do it together. One, two, three... One more time. One, two, three. Okay, those of you out there, I want you to 
right? Good, right there in the message line right now. Good, 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 good. There should be 130 goods going on there right now. The reality is that you and I need to understand all things work together for good. Now? No. Not right now. Not right now. The reality is that you and I have a hope for all things being good. But they're not all good yet. And this is important for you and I to remember that. But it is true for those who are called according to His purpose. So God called me to salvation. And He came into my life. I don't know how you came to Christ. But I can tell you, if you came to Christ, He called you to Himself. Whether it was a long call or a short call or a miraculous call or, you know, I, everybody's different. But the fact is, is that God calls you to Himself. And the reality for you and I, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Meaning, that's what we're all about. We're about becoming like Jesus. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Meaning, Jesus became the firstborn of salvation for all of us. And we become his brothers and sisters as we believe and trust in him. By grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 30 says, are you with me? Verse 30? Yes? Yes? All right. Verse 30 says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So if I invited you to go to dinner with me, and I said, I'm going to pick you up, I'm going to take you, I'm going to pay for you, and I am going to do everything you need. I'm going to have it all for you. Okay? That's exactly what this is saying. The Lord picked us up, and is taking us to dinner, and is taking us to dessert, and is taking us out for a night, and taking us all the way through, and he's paying for it all. And all we got to do is what? Accept it, trust it, and ride with him. And don't complain about what he gives us. Well, I don't like Brussels sprouts, <laughs> you know. The fact is, is that the Lord actually dishes it up for us. So notice, he predestined, he called, he justified, and he will glorify. He will bring us to glory. Verse 31 says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. So just remember, you got a can of whoop them. All you got to do is open it up. and Everything that's going on in your life will be beaten by the whoop them that Jesus can put on it. And you and I need to trust in that. Now, don't go around telling people that Pastor Dave said you need a whoopee cushion. Okay, that's not what I said. I said you need a can of whoopee, all right? And the bottom line is, is that God can defeat anything. Nothing. Nothing can keep us from God. Nothing can keep us from that salvation. Even your stupidity. Even my stupidity. Even a completely cockeyed world. Nothing can separate us from God. Isn't that beautiful? Whatever he starts, he will finish. Whatever he's begun, he will complete. You and I become his adoption. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Meaning, whatever the Father did and the Spirit did with the Son are going to be the same thing that we experience. But that means there's going to be some hard times before we walk in the newness of life and ascend in glory. We have to go through what Christ went through, but whatever he did in Christ, he will do in us. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Nobody. But Satan does it all day long, doesn't he? I say to myself often, did I just think that? <laughs> did that just come up in my head? Did I, my goodness, what a, lousy person I am you know but the bottom line is is that yes I am a sinner forgiven and made by grace a different person so those things do not become my life but they are things that I have to deal with and the reality is that God gives us his grace and who can actually bring a charge against us nobody nobody it is God who justifies. 
Who is to condemn? Nobody. Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed interceding for us. So not only has Jesus actually done the work and is going to complete the work in us, but he's actually interceding for us. That took me a long time to figure that out. It took me a long time to figure that out. <coughs> Pardon me. You know, if you want to get something done in a government situation, one of the things that helps is to know somebody. Amen? It's not what you know, but who you know. Okay? And here's the deal. If we know Jesus, we got the Father's ear. We got the Holy Spirit. We have somebody who is interceding for us. Now, I don't mean you, can't be, you can be a knucklehead and get by with it. You can't do unjust things or anything like that. You're not going to have his assistance on being wrong. But you have his assistance in walking in the life of faith. Isn't that beautiful? That's a beautiful thing to remember. So, we're not insecure. We are secure. We are secure. And you know, uh, the whole world's getting cameras, right? How's that working? Well, they take stuff with cameras on. <laughs> I mean, you know, every day you see these posts, of, uh, you know this person? They took everything off my porch. They took my car. They went through my house. You know, I mean, they do it all on camera now. So we can see them doing it, but can't stop them. The bottom line is that you and I are secure because God's got us. He put his spirit in us. He has planted his seal on us, and we have him in our lives. In verse 30, it tells us that he predestined. But the fact is, is that who who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who's at the right hand of God? Who's indeed interceding for you and I? I think these should be good. Oh, well, that didn't work. <laughs> Henry? <gasps> Gorilla. <laughs> it never works. <laughs> Gorilla <laughs> super glue. Of course. Other super glues get brittle and break. Gorilla super glue's rubber toughened formula holds even after repeated drops and bumps. Oh, thanks. You know, this reminds me of the time, and you're gone. Gorilla super glue for the toughest jobs on planet Earth. So the reality is that for you and I, we are glued to the Lord and nothing can separate us from God. Isn't that beautiful? That is absolutely beautiful. Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Shall tribulation? No. No. Or distress? No. Or persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Danger? No. Sword? No. That's a pretty exhaustive list. Nothing can separate you from God. Nothing. Why does that matter? Because we're secure. We're secure. We're solid. Those of you here, probably at home, you're sitting in a chair and you ain't even thinking about the chair. You don't think about whether it can hold you. You don't think about the supports. You don't think about any of it. You just sit in it. And you rest there. And you get sleepy and take a nap. And the fact is, is that it's because you're secure. You're secure. If I put you on a little bit of a pen and you had to go like this all the time, you would never get any rest. You would be absolutely stressed out. The bottom line for you and I is that nothing can separate us from God. Verse 36 says, As, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, he's talking about the fact that they're going through persecution. They're going through tribulation. They're going through difficulty. They're being put in jail. They're being actually murdered. There are Christians that actually do not get a good return on their faith except for in glory. Here he's talking about, look, man, we've been through some tough stuff so that you could have faith. And remember this, your faith isn't just for you. Your faith is also for others around you and those who will come after you. You know, one of the things that I'm deeply concerned about is making sure that Green Valley continues to be a viable, Bible-believing, Jesus-preaching, soul-saving, 
light shining, hell kicking church. Not for me. I'll be dead and gone. But this church needs to be in this town so that this town doesn't go to hell. Amen? And this is important for you and I to understand. We may go through all these hard things, but the fact is, is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the facts. We are okay no matter what goes on around us, no matter what goes on inside of us, no matter what goes on in this world. We are permanent with God. If you told me, David, all you got to do is enter the race and you will win. I'm going to enter. I'm going to get on the finish. I'm going to get on the starting line. I'm going to enter. If I know what, I'm going to win. Uh, I remember, you know, when I went and got all my degrees and so on and so forth, it would have been really nice if they had just given them to me, you know. I had to work at it and earn them and that kind of thing. That's not the way salvation actually is. You just have to matriculate. You have to enroll. All you have to do is believe and repent and confess and believe, and then God will bring you to the very finish line. So you and I are actually permanent. So the reason I want us to understand that today is this. Nothing can separate us from God. Nothing. And even when I make my mistakes, even when I don't do what I know I should do, or I do what I know I shouldn't do, or I struggle, the fact is, is that God still has me. I'm struggling in his hand, and he will never let me go. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks today for your word. Romans 7 and 8 are some beautiful, beautiful scriptures. Lord, that tape that fixes a boat, that glue that fixes glasses, Lord, you are truly the spiritual gorilla. You are the spiritual flex tape. You are the one thing that brings us and fixes us and makes us have hope and glory. Lord, this world is fallen and there are many who are lost. Thank you, God, that you have put your grace and your power and your presence in our lives and that we are born again, saved, redeemed, adopted, grafted in. Lord, you have picked us up and you're carrying us to the very end. Lord, thank you today. Help us, Lord, not to lose sight of what our destination is. It's not a life without pain. It is a life of trust in faith that you will bring us to our home. We love you and we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.